Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and I am back with The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann Wies, and we are on Chapter 4, The Homeward Journey. I soon discovered that Fritz found the weight of his canes considerably more than he had expected. He shifted them from shoulder to shoulder, then for a while carried them under his arm, and finally stopped short with a sigh. I had no idea, he said, that a few reeds would be so heavy. Never mind, son, I said, patience and courage. Do you not remember the story of Aesop and his bread basket? How heavy he found it when he started and how light at the end of his journey. Let us each take a fresh staff and then fasten the bundle crosswise with your gun. We did so and once more stepped forward. Fritz presently noticed that, from, that I, from time to time, sucked the end of my cane. Oh, come, said he, that's a capital plan of yours, father, I'll do that too. So saying, he began to suck most vigorously, but not a drop of the juice could he extract. How is this, he asked, how do you get the juice out, father? Think a little, I replied, you are quite as capable as I am of finding out the way even if you do not know the real reason for your failure. Oh, of course, said he, it is like trying to suck marrow from a marrow bone without making a hole in the other end. Quite right, said I. You form a vacuum in your mouth and the end of your tube and expect the air to f force down the liquid from the other end, which it cannot possibly enter. Fritz was speedily perfect in the accomplishment of sucking sugar cane, discovering by experience the necessity for a fresh cut at each joint or knot in the cane through which the juice would not flow. He talked of the pleasure of initiating his brothers in the art and of how Ernest would enjoy the coconut milk with which he had filled his flask. My dear boy, said I, you need not have added that to your load. The chances are it is vinegar by the time we get home. In the heat of the sun, it will ferment soon after being drawn out of the nut. Vinegar? Oh, that would be a horrid bore. I must look directly and see how it is getting on, cried Fritz, hastily swinging the flask from his shoulder and tugging out of the cork with a loud pop. The contents came forth foaming like champagne. There now, said I, laughing as he tasted this new luxury. You will have to exercise moderation again, friend Fritz. I dare say it is delicious, but it will go to your head if you venture deep into your flask. My dear father, you cannot think how good it is. Do take some vinegar indeed. This is like excellent wine. We were both invigorated by this unexpected draught and went on so merrily after it that the distance to the place where we had left our gourd dishes seemed less than we expected. We found them quite dry and very light and easy to carry. Just as we had passed through the grove in which we had breakfast, Turk suddenly darted away from us and sprang furiously among the troop of monkeys, which were gamboling playfully on the turf at a little distance from the trees. They were taken by surprise completely and the dog, now really ravenous with hunger, had seized and was fiercely tearing one to pieces before we could approach the spot. His luckless victim was the mother of a tiny little monkey, which being on her back when the dog flew at her hindered her flight. The little creature attempted to hide among the grass and in trembling fear watched its mother. On perceiving Turk's bloodthirsty design, Fritz had eagerly rushed to the rescue, flinging away all he was carrying and losing his hat in the haste. All to no purpose, as far as the poor mother ate was concerned, and a laughable scene ensued, for no sooner did the young monkey catch sight of him then at one bound it was on his shoulders, and holding fast by his thick curly hair, it firmly kept its seat in spite of all he could do to dislodge it. He screamed and plunged about as he endeavored to shake or pull the creature off, but all in vain. It only clung the closer to his neck, making the most absurd grimaces. 
I laughed so much at this ridiculous scene that I could scarcely assist my terrified boy out of his awkward predicament. At last, by coaxing the monkey, offering it a bit of biscuit, and gradually disentangling its small sinewy paws from the curls it grasps so tightly, I managed to relieve poor Fritz, who then looked with interest at the baby ape, no bigger than a kitten, as it lay in my arms. What a jolly little fellow it is, exclaimed he. Do let me try to rear it, father. I dare say coconut milk would do until we can bring the cow and the goats from the wreck. If he lives, he might be useful to us. I believe monkeys instinctively know what fruits are wholesome and what are poisonous. Well, said I, let the little orphan be yours. You bravely and kindly exerted yourself to save the mother's life. Now you must train your child carefully, for unless you do so, its natural instinct will prove mischievous instead of useful to us. Turk was meanful, was meanwhile devouring with great satisfaction the little animal's unfortunate mother. I could not grudge at him, and continued hunger might have made him dangerous to ourselves. We did not think it necessary to wait until he had dined, so we prepared to resume our march. The tiny ape seated himself in the coolest way imaginable on Fritz's shoulder. I helped to carry his canes, and we were on some distance before Turk overtook us, looking uncommonly well pleased and licking his chops as though recalling the memory of his feast. He took no notice of the little monkey, but it was very uneasy at the sight of him and scrambled down into Fritz's arms, which was so inconvenient to him that he advised, devised a plan to relieve himself of his burden. Calling Turk and seriously enjoining obedience, he seated the monkey on his back, securing it there with a cord, and then putting a second string around the dog's neck that he might lead him. He put a loop of the knot into the comical writer's hand, saying gravely, Having slain the parent, Mr. Turk, you will please carry the son. At first, this arrangement mightily displeased them both, but by and by, they yielded to it quietly, and the monkey especially amused by riding along with the air of a person perfectly at ease. We look just like a couple of mountains, Mount Banks on their way to a fair with animals at an exhibit, said I. What an outcry the children will make when we appear. Juno was the first to be aware of their approach and gave notice of it by loud barking, to which Turk replied with such hearty good will that his little rider, terrified at the noise his steed was making, slipped from under the cord and fled to his refuge on Fritz's shoulder where he regained his composure and settled himself comfortably. Turk, who was by this time, who by this time knew where he was, finding himself free, dashed forward to rejoin his friends and announce our coming. One after another, our dear ones came running to the opposite bank, testifying in various ways their delight at our return, and hastening upon up on their side of the river as we on ours to the ford at which we had crossed in the morning. We were quickly on the other side and full of joy and affection. Our happy party was once more united. The boys suddenly perceiving the little animal which was cling clinging close to their brother in alarm at the tumult of voices shouted in ecstasy, a monkey, a monkey. Oh, how splendid. Where did Fritz find him? What may we give him to eat? Oh, what a bundle of sticks. Look at those curious great nuts father has got. We could neither check this confused torrent of questions, nor get in a word to answer them. At length, when the excitement subsided a little, I was able to say a few words with a chance of being listened to. I am truly thankful to see you all safe and well, and thank God, our expedition has been very satisfactory, except that we have entirely failed to discover any trace of our shipmates. If it be the will of God, said my wife, to leave us alone on this solitary place, let us be content and rejoice that we are all together in safety. Now we want to hear all of your adventures, and let us relieve you of your burdens, added she, taking my game bag. 
Jack shouldered my gun, Ernest took the coconuts, and little France carried the gourds. Fritz distributed the sugar canes among the brothers, and handing Ernest his gun, replaced the monkey on Turk's back. Ernest soon found the burden with which Fritz had laden him so too heavily for his taste. His mother, perceiving this, offered to relieve him part of the load. He gave up willingly the coconuts, but no sooner had he done so that his elder brother exclaimed, Hello, Ernest, you surely do not know what you are parting with. Did you really intend to hand over the good coconuts without so much as tasting them? What? Hall, are they really coconuts? cried Ernest. Do let me take them again, mother. Do let me cook look at them. No, thank you, replied my wife with a smile. I have no wish to see you again overburdened. Oh, but I have only to throw away these sticks, which are of no use, and then I can carry them. Worse and worse, said Fritz. I have a particular regard for those heavy, useless sticks. Did you ever hear of sugar canes? The word was scarcely out of his mouth when Ernest began to suck vigorously at the end of the cane, with no better result, however, than Fritz had obtained as they were on the march. Here, said Fritz, let me show you the trick of it. And he speedily set all the youngsters to work exacting, extracting the luscious juice. My wife, as a prudent housekeeper, was no less delighted that the children with, than the children with this discovery. The sight of the dishes also pleased her greatly, for she longed to see us eat once more like civilized beings. Now you remember that they had brought the coconuts and they had scooped out the coconut shells and were going to use the coconuts as dishes. We went into the kitchen and there found preparations for a truly sumptuous meal. Two forked sticks were planted on the ground on either side of the fire. On these rested a rod from which hung several tempting-looking fish. Opposite them hung a goose from a similar contrivance, slowly roasting while the gravy dropped into a large shell placed beneath it. In the center sat the great pot, from which issued the smell of a most delicious soup. To crown this splendid array stood an open hogshead full of Dutch cheeses. All this was very pleasant to two hungry travelers, but I was about to beg my wife to spare the poultry until our stock should have increased when she, perceiving my thought, quickly relieved my anxiety. This is not one of our geese, she said, but a wild bird that Ernest killed. Yes, said Ernest, it is a penguin, I think. It let me get quite close so that I knocked it on the head with a stick. Here are its head and feet, which I preserve to show you. The bill is, you see, narrow and curved downward, and the feet are webbed. It is funny little bits of useless wings, and its eyes looked so solemnly and sedately at me that I was almost ashamed to kill it. Do you think it must have been a penguin? I have little doubt on the matter, my boy, and I was about to make a few remarks on the habits of this bird when my wife interrupted me and begged us to come to dinner and continue our natural history conversation at some future time. We then sat down before the appetizing meal prepared for us, our gourds coming for the first time into use, and having done it full justice produced the coconuts by way of dessert. Here is better food for your little friend, said I to Fritz, who had been vainly endeavoring to persuade the monkey to taste dainty morsels of the food we had been eating. The poor little animal has been accustomed to nothing but its mother's milk. Fetch me a saw, one of you, and then I then, after extracting the milk of the nuts from their natural holes, carefully cut the shells in half, thus providing several more useful basins. The monkey was perfectly satisfied with the milk and eagerly sucked the corner of the handkerchief dipped in it. The sun was now rapidly sinking behind the horizon, and the poultry, retiring for the night, warned us that we must follow their example. Having offered up our own prayers, we laid down on our beds. The monkey crouched down between Jack and Fritz, and we were all soon fast asleep. We did not, however, long enjoy this repose. A loud barking from our dogs, who were on guard outside the tent, awakened us, 
and the fluttering and the cackling of our poultry warned us that a foe was approaching. Fritz and I sprang up and seized our guns and rushed out. There we found a desperate combat going on. Our gallant dogs, surrounded by a dozen or more large jackals, were fighting bravely. Four of their opponents lay dead, but the others were in no way deterred by the fate of their comrades. Fritz and I, however, sent bullets through the heads of a couple more, and the rest galloped off. Turk and Juno did not intend that they should escape so cheaply, and pursuing them, they caught, killed, and devoured another of the animals, regardless of their near relationship. Fritz wish, wished to save one of the jackals, that he might be able to show it to his brothers in the morning. Dragging, therefore, the one that he had shot near the tent, he concealed it, and we once more returned to our beds. Wow, every day is exciting in this book. And of course, they have to eat, so they're having to um, eat just about anything. And the dogs certainly are out for whatever they can find. First a monkey and then a jackal. So that is the end of um, chapter four. This, this one doesn't have a lot of pictures. I'm looking to see. This chapter had no pictures at all. The next chapter will be chapter five. We revisit the wreck. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.